please welcome Azure Chief Technology Officer and Technical Fellow, Mark Rosinovich. Hello, everybody. How's build going? Awesome. Yeah, and hello to everybody online that's watching. My name is Mark Rosinovich, and I've got an action-packed 45 minutes with you today to talk about Azure innovation. I thought one of the things that I'd start with is just talking a little bit about the scale that Azure's gotten to. And the scale is massive in terms of physical scale. Just some numbers here, and you've all heard the more than 60 regions around the world, more than 200 data centers. We're actually building between 50 and 100 data centers per year at this point to meet the demands for cloud growth. There's 175,000 miles of WAN cabling connecting all our data centers together, and then we're also going out, of course, onto the edge, not just the edge land on terrestrial edge, but also the space edge with our Azure Orbital program. We also have achieved massive logical scale, and so here are some numbers. And I, if you've come to my Azure Innovation sessions before, you've seen previous versions of these numbers. The numbers have gotten just astronomical. In fact, we hit an uh, fascinating milestone there up on the top left with Azure Storage in terms of the number of transactions that we operate around the world on our storage systems per month. And you read that number correctly, that's over 1,000 trillion requests per month. And I think that's a quadrillion, as my memory serves me correctly, as far as that number. I'm not going to cover all of these, but another one that I think is very noteworthy is the one right next to that, which, which is the number of AI inferences or serving requests on Azure Machine Learning per month. I think at Ignite, we were somewhere in the tens of billions. We're at 470 billion, and that number is, of course, growing exponentially with all the demand for large language models that we're seeing today. I mentioned the, all those miles of cabling connecting our regions together across our WAN. One of the areas that we're innovating is how can we make our WAN more efficient? And if you take a look at the traditional way that data centers are connected, it's with optical cabling. There's a type of cabling that the industry has been working on and that we think is ready for prime time, and that's called hollow core fiber. Hollow core fiber has some fascinating characteristics compared to the traditional fiber, which is filled with solid material. Hollow core fiber, as its name implies, is filled with air. And what that means is that that light can travel more efficiently through it than it can through a solid material. That means it actually travels faster than it would through traditional fiber. In fact, one of the cool measurements that we've done is how fast can we get a message from New York to London over hollow core fiber compared to traditional WAN. Over traditional WAN, 55 milliseconds. Over hollow core fiber, 36 milliseconds. So it's about 47% faster than traditional fiber. And that has benefits in terms of latency, of course, just point to point. But another way that it helps us is that we can expand the search area for data centers within a particular region which have very strict latency envelope requirements. In fact, the boundary that we can start to explore when we're building out data centers in a region has grown by 2.25x because of hollow core fiber. This is just one of the examples of ways that we're pushing forward our infrastructure, researching things ahead of when they're potentially ready, and then working with the industry and partners to bring this stuff to life in our servers. And speaking of servers, let's take a look under the hood of our latest innovations in server infrastructure. I talked about this at Ignite, the way that we've been shifting a lot of computing for our network and storage stacks from our hosts onto accelerated offload cards. So this is a big shift you're seeing in the way that servers are designed really driven by cloud computing, where we're trying to optimize the uh, serving of these very expensive cores to customer workloads, and then running some of the infrastructure processing on lower cost, lower power cores. Specifically in our case, with this offload card that we've got, we've got an FPGA, which is dynamically programmable, it's field programmable gate array, which is where the data flows for our network and storage stacks flow. We've been using FPGAs in Azure since the early 2010s with the introduction of accelerated networking, and now we're accelerating our storage on top of those FPGAs as well. This is on, combined with a system on a chip, which is ARM-based cores running a Linux operating system, 
Mariner Linux, also known in one version that I'll talk a little bit later with the new name that we've announced here at Build. And that is where the agents, the control plane, and other agents that support that computing that's happening on those FPGAs happens. I happened to have one example of those cards right here that I thought would be interesting to show. Just so you can see what we're putting on our servers. This actually is the next generation of the cards that we've got in our servers today, the one that I'm talking about right now. So this one, we haven't actually started to roll out across our fleet yet. It represents the next generation and next jump in capabilities of our hardware infrastructure. Now, one of the benefits of using FPGAs is that we can dynamically upgrade our infrastructure without changing out the hardware. And I've actually got a very concrete example of how we're taking advantage of that with our new EBS v5 virtual machine sizes. I talked at Ignite about our new, at the time, EBS v5 generation virtual machines that use these accelerated offload cards, providing more IOPS and more bandwidth or throughput than the previous generation of virtual machine sizes, the EBS v4s. We've upgraded the code on the FPGAs on the exact same hardware and have improved the performance of the EBS v5 when it comes to storage by two and a half times, which is eight times more performance than the previous generation EBS v4s. So if you're running an EBS v5, you will either already have been upgraded to this performance level or will be soon because we're rolling this out across the fleet. The number of IOPS we deliver is cloud leading at 400,000 IOPS, and you can see 10 gigabytes of remote storage throughput. That's on top of a network adapter that supports 100 gigabits of throughput. Let's go take a look at a demo of that in action. So what I've got here on the left is the older generation of EBS5, and on the right is a virtual machine with the new version. And I'm running a tool here called Iometer. Iometer lets you drive storage operations on attached devices. In this case, it's virtual disks. And I'm going to kick off Iometer on both of them. And now, if you take a look at what we're seeing, it's 160,000 IOPS, EBS v5, the previous generation of it on the left, and the 400,000 IOPS that I talked about there on the right on the upgraded version of that server. And I'm going to show you the throughput here with a tool called FIO, a Linux tool here. And I've got the same thing, two virtual machines, current on the left, new one on the right. And you can see there's the four gigabytes per second that we're driving on the older generation and the 10 gigabytes we should see here. And there it is on the newer generation. Wasn't that cool? All right, so it obviously wouldn't be billed if I didn't talk about AI. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our AI infrastructure. Of course, this could take a whole session on its own. In fact, if you haven't seen it, there was a mechanics video that we uh, posted yesterday where I'd go under the hood with Jeremy Chapman about our AI supercomputer infrastructure. I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail here about certain aspects of our AI infrastructure. And I'll start by talking about our, our Bing serving platform. Because a lot of people are in the misconception that all Bing chat is doing is serving up GPT-4 for you to interact with. But there's a whole lot that we do under the hood to create a service like that. And it starts with our foundational infrastructure on top of that hardware, which includes the GPUs from NVIDIA, AMD, and others, as well as our CPU infrastructure. On top of that is an AI workload-aware scheduler called Project Forge, formerly called Singularity, if you've seen me talk about that before. And then there's services that manage that capacity, inference serving, which maps user requests down to particular GPUs. And above that is where the models are being deployed. So models like GPT-4, GPT-3.5, GPT-3, other variations of GPT-3, fine-tuned models are all managed by this layer, which we've developed in collaboration with OpenAI. In the case of Bing Chat, it's, of course, GPT-4, and that's what I'm focusing on right here. And you can see some of the components, microservices we've worked on with them, 
including things like a key value cache that lets us swap different users on top of the same GPUs by keeping their state cached on those servers. And then above that is more Azure machine learning infrastructure as well as the Bing infrastructure that takes user requests and sends them down into the models and does things like admission control and managing global capacity of the deployment of these models. I mentioned Project Forge, and Project Forge is really aimed at making the most use of these expensive GPU resources. We don't want people at Microsoft or anywhere else to get a GPU, and when they're not using it, for that GPU to sit idle. So the entire goal of Project Forge is how can we keep those GPUs as close to 100% utilization, even if a workload that's using it goes idle or shuts down. And it, one of the benefits, too, or goals of Project Forge, is trying to make sure that those workloads that are using GPUs operate successfully and without hum any need for human intervention. If you take a look at a run here, this is actually a run that just finished yesterday on Project Forge. I haven't updated the slide. It was running for over 15 days. It actually finished in 18 days on 1,024 GPUs, A180 gigabyte GPUs. And you can see during that timeline, there's been several failures. Now, Project Forge handles all those failures without human intervention required, diagnoses them, recovers the workload, restores from checkpoints, and moves on. Project Forge actually is a globally aware resource scheduler. It abstracts hardware. It also creates a pool of capacity from all the AI resources that we've got around our regions around the world. And what that allows is for individual users, whether it's an application or individual data scientist, to have what's called a virtual cluster rather than a physical cluster that they might sit on. Because it's a virtual cluster and Project Forge supports priorities, it means that they can get deployed on available GPU capacity wherever it happens to be, assuming it meets their data residency and other latency requirements. And if a higher priority workload comes in, they might get evicted, but they might get moved to capacity someplace else if the workload that's evicting them has to be in that particular location. So with this and other features of Project Forge, we can get to close to 100% utilization, including the failure recovery that I talked about. One of the ways that we're exploring to increase efficiency is through something called transparent checkpointing. Now, with transparent checkpointing, the idea here is that we can take a machine learning training job and capture its state without the developer having to do anything. Most of the time today, if an AI developer wants their job to be able to tolerate a failure without losing a lot of work, they've got to code in checkpointing code into their model code. What that checkpoint does is periodically save the state of the model as it's being trained, such that if a server fails, that particular work, worker that was on that server can go back to the previous checkpoint, and the whole job picks up from there. And a checkpoint might happen. The programmer might put in code to checkpoint it every 15 minutes or so. With threat checkpointing, developer doesn't have to write any code. And that means that at runtime, Singularity can automatically checkpoint the job according to whatever the developer has said they want to, whatever frequency they say they want. And that frequency might be a cost versus cost of checkpointing versus cost of lost work in the face of a failure kind of calculation that they make. Transparent checkpointing in Singularity works by using a, a feature of Linux called CRIU, Checkpoint and Restore in User Mode. That CRIU checkpoint checkpoints the state on the CPU. But the big innovation here is Singular, sorry, Project Forge. Project Forge's way that it can checkpoint the state on the GPU as well. And we accomplished this by partnering with NVIDIA and AMD to, to write CRIU code for the GPUs. But Project Forge has to do more than just checkpoint these two states. It has to make sure that they're coordinated, that the state it captures is consistent across the GPU and the CPU, and not just that, but consistent across all the servers in a cluster, which can be hundreds or thousands of them. Project Forge takes care of this automatically and deals with all the forms of parallelism, data model operator parallelism, or pipelining parallelism that AI machine learning models use for efficiency. It does this consistency and understands what the workload is doing with something we call a device proxy. So if you take a look, there's the CPU address space, 
there's the accelerator, and the device proxy slides in the middle and intercepts all the calls from the AI job through a device proxy client in the container, because this is a containerized serverless uh, platform, goes through the device proxy, and at that point, it knows exactly what memory on the GPU is relevant for that particular worker. It also understands when there's barriers happening, when there's communication happening, and so it can find the right places to create consistent checkpoints. So one of the questions that we had is, this device proxy, this transparent checkpointing is fantastic. How much overhead is it going to introduce? So we've run some measurements, and this is from a published paper on Project Forge called Singularity. And you can see almost no overhead. In fact, there's some funny numbers in there. Does anybody spot some funny numbers when it comes to overhead? There's some negative overhead numbers in there, which you might be saying, OK, so what's up with the negative overhead? The negative overhead is actually a side effect of the fact that some of the uh, PyTorch APIs are synchronous in nature, or in, and the CUDA APIs are synchronous in nature when Project Forge actually takes and converts them into asynchronous APIs underneath the hood. What that means is that it opportunistically will return a success to the model, the training job, which will proceed. If there is actually a failure later in that API call that then the device proxy makes, it'll surface that back up to the model at a later point in time. And that's how you get these negative performance numbers. Let's go take a look at one of my favorite capabilities that's coming with transparent checkpointing in Project Forge. And that is checkpointing in a Jupyter Notebook. How many of you have used a Jupyter Notebook on top of a GPU? If you're like me, I got so frustrated taking Coursera deep learning classes when I'd walk away from my Jupyter Notebook, come back, the cells look like they're alive, but they don't work anymore. And that experience looked a little like this. Here I've got MinGPT, open source AI training notebook from the web. I'm going to execute a bunch of cells. And you can see one of the cells defines this trainer object. Now I'm going to restart the kernel. The next cell that depends on that trainer object is actually going to fail. Because I've restarted the cell, and even though it looks like it's got its state, it actually doesn't. Now, with Project Forge's special kernel, I'm going to run a bunch of cells in the notebook. I'm actually going to kick off the training job itself. Now, this training job, if you look at the lower right, you can see GPU utilization and memory, and it's actually going to be fairly low. That's because this is an A100 80 gigabyte, 80 gigabyte GPU, and that model is extremely small. But you can see it running. And it's going to run for some iterations. And when it completes, what's going to happen is Project Forge sees it go idle and checkpoints the model on the GPU memory. Now, because I'm showing you stuff that's not production yet, I'm going to have to, there's the run at 0%. I'm going to have to run a script to checkpoint the Jupyter Notebook's kernel state itself, which I'm doing here. And so now I've checkpointed the GPU and the CPU. I'm going to kill that Jupyter Notebook in Azure Machine Learning Studio. And now I'm going to restart it. Now, under normal circumstances, I'd have the experience you saw first, which is I go back to the notebook. All the cells you know, have their outputs, but they're actually dead. Now, what I'm going to do is restore the Python kernel here, and then reopen that notebook. And at that point, you're going to see that I'm at the cell right after the training job cell. I run it, and no error. It succeeds. What that actually triggers is Project Forge to restore the GPU checkpoint, find one, restore it, and you can see the GPU memory goes up again. And you can see that I got my output, which is sending some prompt queries into that trained model for me to go see how it works. So transparent checkpoint is, I think, going to revolutionize data, the data scientist inner loop when it comes to Jupyter Notebooks. <laughs> now, can, question is, can we accelerate other workloads with GPUs? GPUs are really great at matrix and vector calculations. They've got massive parallelism. One of the questions we ask ourselves is, can we accelerate SQL on top of a GPU? And so we've started to explore this. 
We call this tensor query processing. It's taking a SQL statement like the one you see there, parsing it, converting it to in-memory intermediate representation, tensorizing it, and then downloading it on a GPU, part, the part that is the actual tensor processing part of the query, onto a GPU, the rest of it onto a CPU, and then executing the query. Can this do better than what we see with the CPU? Let's go take a look at that in action. So what I'm going to show you here is on a TPCH benchmark, one of the queries from it, running on a CPU, 64 core, 256 gigabytes of RAM. I'm going to kick off the compile in a warm-up test of the query. And then I'm going to run the benchmark, the TPCH benchmark. You can see Spark query. And now that's going to take some time to run while that's doing. Over on the right side, I'm going to tensor compile that query and download it to an NVIDIA GPU using the CUDA API. So I compiled the query. I'm going to run the benchmark. And you can see it's already done. Less than half a second to run it. Let's go back and see how the CPU is doing. It's still going. And there it goes. Close to 10 seconds. This is actually 20 times faster on the GPU than the CPU. And we've actually seen, in some queries, up to 70 times faster. So lots of questions still to answer here, but this gives you a taste of how we're exploring how to use GPUs for other types of workloads. <laughs> now, let, let's talk about cloud-native infrastructure. And one of the first things that I'm going to mention is the introduction of, and I'm so proud to be able to say this, the announcement of Azure Linux which we've released as a container host OS for the Azure Kubernetes Services GA announced yesterday. I started in Azure in 2010. Does anybody remember what it was called then? Windows Azure. Windows Azure, that's right. And here I am announcing Azure Linux. So this is a really cool thing for me. Um, and the benefits of this, I think, are listed there on the slide, is that we custom create this Linux uh, distro so that it's optimized for our uh, hardware, that it's secure. Um, and it's always up to date. Now, one of the things that we're also looking at uh, is optimizing the performance of container workloads, containerized workloads. Now, if you take a look at attaching persistent volumes to containerized workloads in a public cloud like Azure today, it looks like this. You're attaching Azure disks, and Azure disks are intend were designed for virtual machines. So there's some latency in attaching a disk. There's scale limitations in disks. So we're announcing this build, the preview of Azure Container Storage. Instead of attaching disks to pods, you attach a pool of disks or, or other storage resources like local disks or even elastic SAN disks. And that means that, that those pooled resources can be quickly attached and detached because they're kind of pre-allocated and ready to go. Let's go take a look at just how much scale we can get using Azure Container Storage. And with this, I'm going to show you, here I've got the storage pool YAML, which is going to create a storage pool. It's actually going to create eight storage pools of 810 gigabytes each. And you're going to see why I need so many, so many gigabytes of storage in my storage pools here, because I'm going to create a stateful set of 3,000 pod replicas. Each one of them will request a one gigabyte persistent volume. So that's a total of 3,000 gigabytes of storage that I want attached to 3,000 pods. There I go and create the pool. Now I'm going to create a, 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 a namespace, then deploy the scale set YAML. And now we're going to watch those pods launch. Each one of those has a persistent volume attached to it. And we're close to, we're at 1,600, halfway there. And there we go, 2591, and there we go, 3,000. So 3,000 disks attached to 3,000 pods, each one with one gigabyte in size, something that just is not possible on standard disks today. So one of the challenges with container images is keeping them up to date, like I mentioned, uh, keeping these things patched with, for security vulnerabilities. One of the big challenges is just the very architecture of container 
images and the layering that they've got. Where if you've got a vulnerability at layer one, before you can get your application secure that depends on it, it depends on every layer in between you and that getting updated with the layers beneath it that include the fixes. If you're talking about vulnerabilities that could potentially end your business, that's a long chain of dependencies you've got to wait on. So in my incubations team, we've been exploring how do we address this, make it possible for us to quickly respond to security emergencies when it comes to vulnerabilities, like we do with traditional operating systems, and just keep images fresh without having to rebuild all the layers. So this is called Project Copacetic. It's public. You can go find it on GitHub. The idea here is we take a vulnerability scanner like Trivi, scan the image, the container, for vulnerabilities, take the output, pass it to the Copa tool from Copacetic, which will go figure out what updates need to be made, use BuildKit to mount the image, use a package manager if one's there inside the image, or use one externally for distroless images, create a patch diff, and then create a new patch layer that you can deploy. So let's go take a look at that in action. So here, I'm going to Docker pull OPA policy agent. You see four images, four layers, run the vulnerability scanner, and this hasn't been patched since last year, so it's got a bunch of really critical vulnerabilities in OpenSSL and LibSSL. I'm going to take now that output from the Trivi scanner and pass it to the COPA tool, along with the directions to create a new patched image. And you can see COPA now is doing an APT update to fetch the latest versions of those vulnerable packages. And it's going to be finished here in a second. It's create, create, exporting its layer. It's created the patched image. And if we go take a look, you can see at the top, there's the COPA commands that were executed. Now, if I scan that container, that patch container again, zero vulnerabilities. The thing has been patched. And that was deep in the layering of that container. So I didn't have to wait for all the build steps like I normally would. Uh, let's talk a little bit about cloud-native programming models. And some of you probably have heard of Dapper. It's been referenced in several sessions here at Build. This is also a project that came out of the incubations team in the office of the CTO, and now it's part of CNCF. If you haven't seen Dapper, you should check it out. It basically creates portability for your application. It handles best practices. It lets developers focus on their code and not have to worry about SDKs for all the different implementations of these different capabilities, like state management and service-to-service -service invocation and authorization. Dapper takes care of that all. Dapper recently introduced a new building block. A building block means a capability where you can plug in at runtime, at deployment time, an implementation. And that building block is workflow. Just about every major non-trivial application has a workflow in it somewhere. There's probably, even at Microsoft, hundreds of custom bespoke workflow engines sitting inside our microservice applications. But with Dapper, we want to make it easy for people to just pick up workflow and use it, and also to be able to use whatever workflow engine they want underneath the hood. Here, this is the Dapper workflow sidecar or component that has a workflow engine and it's responsible for kicking off tasks, keeping track of their activity, and doing retry. Let's go take a look at how workflow in Dapper means that a common task that consists of workflow for a cloud-native application is just taken care of automatically. So here I've got several steps written in an application using the Dapper workflow SDK. Authenticating, this is order processing, so it authenticates the user, checks some inventory to see if there's enough items, if there's insufficient, sends a notification that we need to order more. And you can see here, uh, one of the insight things that you get out of Dapper is you get recording of everything your application does as it interacts with Dapper. And here you can see one of those order processing workflows that succeeded and the trace that we get for it. But what I'm going to show you here is execution of one of those order processing workflows. I'm going to order some company cars. I'm going to order, let's seven of them. 
and that kicks off a workflow that I just showed, that while it's running, I'm going to kill the order processing microservice. And then we're going to see Dapper Workflow Engine automatically retry to try to complete that payment. I'll go restart the order processing service. And at that point, the workflow is able to complete successfully. And so me as a developer just said, here are the steps. Dapper, you go figure out how to do these steps. Make sure it's resilient. Deal with any failures. And I can go on and do other things. And so this is really, I think, promises to really be the spine for cloud native applications using a serverless workflow like this. Now, one of the ways that we keep uh, our infrastructure very efficient is by tightly packing customers together. Either virtual machines, and that technology has been around for a long time. More recently, within the last decade, we've introduced hypervisor based isolation for containers with, uh, with Hyper-V. So you can see that in the middle. And those address you know, traditional OS-based applications, containerized applications, but we really see a place for user-defined functions, small functions that will execute either in the network, network data plane, like on a front door service, or as a user-defined function sitting inside of a storage service. But we need to strongly isolate them as well. And Wasm, while it has a great sandboxing technology and it's really got a great ecosystem around it, lacks the kind of isolation that we require for running a public cloud. So we've been working on how to solve this problem. And we've come up with something we call a micro VM, which can isolate tiny sandbox, create tiny sandboxes, whether Wasm or some other runtime and strongly isolate them with the guarantees we need on top of the same hypervisor stack. Hyperlite works by giving it an application, the ability to go create a micro sandbox, a micro virtual machine, load some code into it, and then call that code. And let's go see just how awesome this is. This is one of my favorite demos here. So here I've got I'm going to show you, I've got uh, running on a Linux machine. Linux DOM 0 is what we call Linux as the host partition for Hyper-V. And you can see Microsoft Hypervisor there. If I take a look at the amount of free RAM on this system, you can see it's, or the used RAM, it's got 1.1 gigabyte used. Now I'm going to kick off a script that's going to launch 2,000 micro VMs. And it did it, and you can see it did it in less than two seconds. I've got 2,000 micro sandboxes running on this VM. And if I go take a look at how much memory I've consumed, each one of those is just about 300 megabytes in size. So tiny, able to handle user-defined function. Now I'm going to have make some function calls just to show you that this is kind of performance that's close to just calling another function across a process. But I'm actually calling into a, a, hyper, a, a virtual machine. And you can see the latency was about 250 microseconds. And as far as programming models, we want to make it really easy for people to create these. So here's a Blazor app, which is a website that says hello and prints a request count, which is a static variable. And if I launch this, there it is, running on plain vanilla OS. And if I do refreshes, every time I refresh, I'm going to see the request count go up because that's a static variable that's increasing. So let's say that I want to strongly isolate that code. I'm going to use the Hyperlite isolator. And it's as easy as invoking that chunk of code and giving it to Hyperlite to create a sand, put it in a sandbox. And now, each time I call invoke, a new micro VM is going to be created from scratch, which means none of these are going to share any state with any other. There it is running WASM. And if I do refreshes now, that count stays the same, which is because each one of those is a fresh micro VM. So that's the kind of programming model that we're creating for this thing. All right, let's talk about confidential computing. How many people have heard of confidential computing? So quite a few of you have. Word's getting out. It's been a huge year for confidential computing, which promises to protect data while it's in use which accompanies data protection at rest and data protection in transit. 
And it does this with the hardware root of trust, which creates a box, unlike hypervisor isolation I was just talking about, this creates a shell around uh, an application. That shell is encrypted and rooted in hardware that measures what's in that box so, and signs it so that that box can present itself to something else, which will then know that it's being protected by hardware, AMD, SMV, uh, SEV, SMP, or Intel TDX, which is coming out, confidential virtual machine technology. It's also been a great year in terms of GPUs. So we've been partnering with NVIDIA to bring out confidential GPUs. A version of a confidential GPU in A100s and full confidentiality in the H100 Hopper GPUs, which a preview is coming soon for. This will allow end-to-end -end protection of AI workloads, whether training or inference, between the GPU and the CPU. We've also been working on bringing confidentiality to pods, and we announced confidential ACI earlier this spring. We're, announced, we're showing you a preview of what we're working on with the Kata open source community, not just on Kata strong isolation, but also Kata confidentiality. So this is called Kata CC for confidential containers. And the idea here is that you can make a shell around a container running on Kubernetes and making that confidential. And I want to show you an example of that with the scenario, which is we're in a store, we're seeing cell phone signals of customers coming into the store, and for customers that have registered with us, we want to send them coupons as they shop around the store. But we want to protect the confidentiality of people that aren't our customers that are coming into the store and make sure that nobody sees those cell phone records. So the way to do that is to have the processing of those queries sitting in confidential computing. So here, the cell phone reader, the producer here, is going to be sending encrypted cell phone IDs to event hubs through Dapper, which will then be read by the application, which will decrypt them because they're running in confidential computing and be able to send coupons. And so let's go take a look at that in action. So here I'm running the Dapper producer. It's creating these encrypted fake cell phone messages, IMEIs, or the way you identify cell phones. If we go look at event hubs, you can see that we've got a bunch of messages with encrypted cell phone IDs queued up, because we haven't launched the consumer yet, which we're going to do now. And so you can see the consumer code is going to decrypt the message it gets, because it gets a decryption key based on the fact that it's running in confidential computing, check in a database, and just print out to the log whether there was a match or not. In real life, this would actually kick off the coupon code that I mentioned. Here's the deployment YAML. There's the Dapper annotations to talk to the pub sub. Here's the code that says how, which, where it should get the decryption key from if it presents evidence that it's running in confidential computing. And there's the Kata CC isolation at request when it launches. And so here I'm going to launch the pod. And at that point, it's going to start consuming the logs. So let's go dump logs. And you can see the logs that it's dumping well, it's, first it tells us it's, it's running in SNP confidentially. And then it's going to show here, dump the encrypted IDs that it sees. This isn't going to give us any information about who's in the store. But it then tells us it didn't match our database. And so listening for more in this one happens to be a customer that's registered in the database. We have a match. And this is where we would kick off the code to go send them a coupon. And again, Nobody has access to those cell phone records of who's coming into the store. All right, so let's talk a little bit about storage. Because storage is one of those things where there's so much data being produced. And if you take a look at AI, it's one of the big consumers of data. Large AI models, like large language models and other versions of image models, are very data hungry. The problem with data is storing huge amounts of data is very expensive. And this problem has created this interesting dynamic that you can see on this chart here, where it's comparing the digital universe, all the data that's being produced over time, every year, compared to installed capacity. The amount of data produced continues to grow at a much faster rate than the capacity that we've got installed. The only way that we're going to correct this and 
try to make them grow together so that we're storing the data that we want to store for uses by AI analytics, archival purposes, is to bring down the cost of storage. And you might have heard me talk about something called Project Silica. With Project Silica, we store data in glass. And that sounds weird. It sounds like that's something that you could break and very fragile. But actually, glass is much more durable than other types of storage media, like SSDs or hard disks. If you've seen videos before, you haven't seen them, you should go check them out, where we show putting a piece of silica in a microwave, in an oven, scratching it even, and you can still read it afterwards. It can tolerate fire. It lasts tens of thousands of years without degradation. We hit a milestone, you can see here, back in 20, uh, 2020, uh, where Satya actually showed this at Ignite, of encoding of Superman in glass, where we were not able to encode it, but actually read it back out. Uh, but by the way, there was another milestone that's I think even more cool than that one, and that's when we were able to store my copy of my book Zero Day in glass and read it out. Okay, so I thought that was cool. All right, but I actually have a piece of the, uh, this glass here. Is it in here? It is, but I can't open it. There it goes. Um, and this is actually, i just show you here. And that's actually Microsoft Flight Simulator stored in glass. Now, one of the things that we've been working on, I've showed you before the readers and writers for this thing, We've been working about on how do we actually bring this into the data center. And one of the tough challenges we've got bringing into the data center is how do we store this, this glass that has data on it? How do we take glass that's got data on it, find the right sliver, take it to the reader, write on it or read it, and then put it back? So we've been hard, it's something that we can't just buy off the shelf, turns out. So we've been hard at work designing a system, a library for silica. And I've got a video here that's fresh from our research lab in uh, Microsoft Cambridge in England of the Silica Library with a custom-built and designed robot that knows how to go walk the library, fetch the appropriate sliver of glass that's being requested, take it back to the reader, and you can see it's got this cool flipping thing that it does to move up the shelves. You can see that one's pulling it out. And this one's putting one back. So this is just to give you an idea of where we are on our path to production. Many, many steps. This has been going on for years, this project. We're getting closer and closer to making glass a reality. And, and I happen to have, just because I thought it would be cool to show you, one of these robots. Um, so here it is. And you can see the robot that we were seeing is sliding this way. You can see the actuator here and a little piece of glass here and the gears on the back and the fact that it can rotate. And I wonder how much I could get on eBay for this. Uh, uh. So that brings me to the conclusion of the session. I have had even more cool innovations that I just couldn't pack in, which is so frustrating every time that I do one of these uh, because there's just so much cool stuff to show. But I hope that you saw a little taste across the whole spectrum of areas that, from data center infrastructure, networking, containerization, storage, of the kinds of things that we're working on. Some of them still speculative, some of them not released, some of them fresh, kind of across the board, but we're always working on really cool new things. And I want to conclude by just by showing you that I still, my job is the coolest in the world, I still have access to the Mega Godzilla Beast virtual machine that I showed at Ignite. This has 832 cores and 24 terabytes of RAM. And uh, I just decided to put the Azure logo with kind of a matrix effect on it for you. So with that, I hope you have a great build. I'll see you tomorrow.